Hi, welcome to Light Camera Author. I'm Jim Juno, and this is a podcast where we talk with authors who write about Hollywood, movies, music, television, and really anything that catches our fancy. And today I have with me John Higgs. He is, are you over in London? Is that where you're at now? I'm in Brighton on the south coast of England, so just a little bit below London. Brighton, all right. Are you getting ready, getting ready for the coronation, I imagine? I think there is something happening, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've heard something about it. Some Something happening, like, took 70 years to plan and stuff. So. <laughs> but your new book, it came out in February. It's called Live and, I'm sorry, Love and Let mm-hmm. Die, James Bond, The Beatles, and The British Psyche. And this is a book which, you know, I, I'm learning things when I'm reading it. I never realized that the first James Bond movie, Dr. No, mm-hmm. And the first Beatles record, Love Me Do, came out on the same day in the same year. Yeah, the 5th of October, 1962. It's quite a strange coincidence, because, I mean, certainly in in Britain, those are our greatest sort of cultural contributions to, to world culture, I think, in the late 20th century. So the fact that they just sort of popped up on the same day is kind of ridiculous. It was like a Friday afternoon. Suddenly these things, suddenly the most successful film character of all history appeared at the same time as the most successful band of all time. Amazing. On the very same day, in the very same year. Mm. And um, and now let's talk a little bit about, you know, you write that, that even though James Bond and the Beatles have similarities, They also have much larger disparities, Uh, James Bond. Well, let's talk about the Beatles first. I mean, you mentioned that Paul McCartney in the mid-90s was very pleased that almost all their songs dealt with love. Yeah. And whereas James Bond, however, he has, he's 007, he's a double O agent. He has a license to kill uh, with immunity. So he is all about death. Yeah, absolutely. All the Bond films have titles like, you know, Die Another Day, A View to a Kill. His USP is that license to kill, that official, you know, uh, permission to kill anyone he wants to. So he he very much is an avatar of death. Uh, And love and death, uh, an odd pairing. They come up a lot in myth. It's like Mars and Venus. It's like Aries and Aphrodite. In um, Freudian psychology are two competing drives within us are our love drive and our death drive, Eros and Thanatos. Um, and that's kind of contradictory. And there's, our lives are sort of kind of like a struggle uh, between these two competing drives. So when Britain produced these perfect, you know, cultural avatars of these two opposing sides of ourselves, you know, on the same day, at a, at a time when the country was sort of trying to work out who it was now that it wasn't a, you know, a global empire or anything like that. It was, it was a very much a, um, a struggle to define, you know, what, it, what Britain was and who the British people were. So it to suddenly, you know, appear in, in action films and in pop music, these sort of competing sort of forces. Um, it was just too, it was just too tempting a, a, a coincidence to, I had to write about it. The moment you you put the two things together, even though you think, oh, I, I know all about Bond. I know all about the Beatles. The moment you bring them together, something about that context just sort of gives you all this fresh perspective and all these sort of issues of, you know, masculinity and class and, you know, Britain and all these things start to sort of pour out of them. It's just, it was just too tempting for me to resist, I think. That's what one of my questions was, was how did you, how did you, actually get into this book because you know you said you know you were doing research before you even thought about writing it it was you know we've all been lost in a wikipedia hole and i was Mm -hmm. i just found myself on the doctor no wikipedia page one day Uh, i don't know how why i don't know where why i was there but uh, i just saw the release date you know 5th of october 1962 and i'm enough of a beatles nerd that i just thought Mm -hmm. no no, it can't be. Surely it's not. You know, I had to double check. And when I when I saw that, yes, those they were all twins. They were born on the same day. Um, I don't know. My, my mind just started, you know, fizzing with the implications of it. And uh, it was very immediately obvious there was a book there. But they're very hard things to write about Beatles and James Bond because they've been, you know, so much has been said about them. But when you find a little key that unlocks them in a new way, 
you know, it's, it's just a lovely feeling, Jim. Now you mentioned it, now you write in your book, you give a, you give a short, uh, well, I want to say a, a capsule biography of each Beatle. And of course, Ian Fleming, who is the creator of James Bond. Um, it amazes me that in this, in these uh, capsule biographies, they are they they are touched by death at an yeah. early age. Almost almost all the Beatles, not all of them. I think George Harrison, you mentioned, had a That's right. had a happy childhood. But um, Ian, Fle- let's first go go to Ian Fleming. He was a victim of a very dominating father, I believe. You're right. right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not just Ian Fleming and the Beatles, and indeed the character of James Bond. It's almost everyone in this story, you know, has lost a parent or was was raised outside of what we call a nuclear family, uh, something like that. Even like, you know, uh, Linda McCartney, her parents died in a, cr- a, a crash. Yoko Ono um, didn't see her father until... She was about three. Alan Klein was raised in an orphanage. It really is just George Harrison and George Martin were the only people to be raised by both parents. It's just kind of strange. It's a really odd sort of um, uh, odd aspect to this tale. But it affected probably John Lennon and Ian Fleming the worst, I think, because both John Lennon and Ian Fleming had been sent away as a child before they lost their parents. With Ian Fleming, it was the British upper class thing of sending the child away to public school to be, you know, raised in rakes or uh, what we now see as harsh and emotionally controlling conditions. And then his father died. His father was seen as this great uh, uh, family patriarch who was a war hero and a a politician and a, a great man, as he was sort of seen. A character he couldn't really sort of live up to. Whereas John Lennon, his his father was just not around he'd sort of he'd sort of gone and he he was uh it was deemed that his mother wasn't fit to raise him so he was raised by his aunt instead so he was sent away from his mother and you know his mother it's very clear especially if you read the uh the book by uh, Lennon's uh, half sister Julia Baird which is a fantastic mm-hmm. book there was no shortage of love there but it was a shortage of uh respectability it was thought it was the right thing to do to sort of send him away and it's um and that seems to have a really probably more damaging impact on a, a child's psyche than the death of a parent if you compare paul mccartney with john lennon you know paul mccartney lost his mother at a very sort of pivotal age um but we don't see him as damaged in the long term by that as the way we talk about john lennon you know he had his brother he had his his father he was part of a living family it was a tragedy it was grief but it was life it was it was normal to be sent away does seem to be the more damaging sort of thing and then to deal with grief on top of that once you've already been broken um explains a lot about both the character of ian fleming and the character of john lennon i think not only was uh, was Paul Lennon, uh, Paul Lennon, that's good. Not only oh. was John Lennon uh, sent away, Ringo Starr, when he was a uh, young age, he was yeah. sent away. Well, he was sent. He was put in a um, long term hospital care for for about a year on a, on a place called the Wirral, because um, he he you know his story was just Dickensian. It it seems now it just seems um, such a tale of you know poverty and childhood illness, and he wasn't expected to live. Um, he had pleurisy, he had a whole bunch of different uh, diseases. diseases. His mum was told on, I think, three occasions that he was going to die. You know, he didn't really get any education. He didn't really get any schooling. Um, but fortunately, it was at the time uh, that the National Health Service had been set up. So he was able to go into hospital and able to get care and recover. Uh, and that, that's where he discovered drums. He learned drumming at that sort of point. Um, so he's you know, he came through it to become, you know, now Sir Ringo Starr, you know, one of the the wealthiest and most contented people on the planet. But when you see just what a rough background he came from, what a, what a unprivileged and what um, an unlucky sort of uh, uh, background he is, his situation was when it came. It's just extraordinary that of all the people in uh, this book, in this story, he's the one who goes on to marry the Bond girl. Yes, that's right. It's just it's just perfect, really. <laughs> and you know, and also the uh, it, the mere fact that the Beatles, almost all of them, well, I would say all of them, 
they were born during the time of probably what what was the greatest uh, death of upheaval mm. in Europe at that time, World War II. They were all born during that time. I believe, I believe some a couple of them were born in uh, air raid shelters. Uh, that, that's the myth around John Lennon that he was born during an air raid, and Liverpool was bombed uh, a hell of a lot during the Second World War because it's had the docks and, and things like that. Um, it's, it's researchers have now you know gone back and studied the history of air raids on Liverpool, and it doesn't quite match. But he, he was certainly that's the sort of general background of the, they were born in a, a war torn um, uh, town where there were. Yeah, not nightly, but there were bombs falling around you. And, and they was, grew up in bombs, playing in bomb sites. And, and yeah. yeah, there was death and suffering all around them when they were mm. very young. Not, they and, so. Go ahead. Yeah. And um, yeah, it just amazes me. Like John Lennon said that he lost his mother twice. Yeah. Once when he was taken away. And then again, when she was hit by a car. Yeah. You know, it, it just, it just also struck me as that common thread uh, Ian Fleming, um, you know, he was he he was in World War Two, I believe. Yes, he was. He was an assistant to the head of naval intelligence. So quite an interesting place to be during in World War Two. Yeah, they were. So they're all connected with World War Two. But also the thread continues. Like you said, Yoko Ono had had uh, parental uh, issues. I'll call them that, you know, mm. um, but also like even their offspring. Julian Lennon lost his father. Uh, due to an assassination, um, yeah. uh, George Harrison's son, da- Danny or Donnie, I, I'm not sure how he pronounces his name. Donnie, his, yes, Donnie. Donnie. I'm, yeah. Donnie, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, he lost his father when he was a young age, you know, so it kind of continues from the Beatles' parents on to the Beatles' offspring. Yeah, and it's one of the sort of themes that comes out of the book is that um, love ends, but th- there's always death. Death's the one thing that never dies. You know, death will sort of keep coming back. Uh, it's kind of parallels the, parallels the way that the, the James Bond films just keep going and, and keep going and keep going, <laughs> despite all the, you know, the, the critical attacks on them or the, uh, you know, every film from, from about 1967, where it's come out to a newspaper article saying, yeah, you should stop these now. It's just it's just getting a bit embarrassing now. These, these are old hat, you know. The, we don't need these anymore. Stop making these James Bond films. And you got that in the late 60s. You got that all through the 70s. You got that through the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, right up until the last, you know, Daniel Craig film. There's journalists going, you really stop making these films out. But James Bond is like death. It's the one thing that doesn't die. It just keeps going and it keeps going. And it, and it makes no sense in sort of, you know, film logic, the idea that uh, you could create one, you know, action hero and then go on to make 25 sequels, you know, over 60 years, you know, all of which makes money, all of which is successful. You know, if that was possible, every film producer would be doing that, you know. Oh, exactly. It's just not possible. It's just, if it wasn't the fact that James Bond exists, just the idea of it would be so absurd. Right, and there's nothing, nothing, and in your book you say there is nothing to compare to James Bond's longevity. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you mentioned Doctor Who, which a lot of my fans, a lot of the people who watch this show know I'm a Doctor Who fan. Oh, um, excellent. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So, yes. Um, but even even so, uh, it did. Doctor Who didn't have the worldwide appeal right away. No, absolutely. It was only... It was only really to the Matt Smith years when it got any sort of significant sort of oversight. It always had, you know, fans who were dedicated, but it wasn't a broad, you know, cultural thing. Um, Spider-Man is, could possibly overtake um, James Bond. Maybe Harry Potter. And eventually, if they keep... Harry Potter, no. Uh, again, Bond's made more money. Um, even with, with the... Um, uh, Fabulous Beasts franchise it add on top of it. Still, James Bond is ahead once you, you know, allow for inflation and things like that. Um, nothing comes close to it, really. I think the Marvel Universe overall is bigger and probably the Star Wars Universe overall. But for a single character, he is, you know, the most successful uh, character in film history. And no matter who plays James Bond, the movies seem to make money. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's it's really interesting. And what's fascinating is how it's going to um, uh, go in the twenty first century, really, because 
when you know when they first recast when when Sean Connery left, uh, Kobe Broccoli, the producer, he made a big point of saying. It's fine, you know, Bond's one of those characters who can be played by any actor. You know, it's like um, Sherlock Holmes or Tarzan. Those are the examples he gave. And with Sherlock Holmes, that makes total sense. He's, he's still going. But no one's making Tarzan films anymore. <laughs> you know, the, 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 at the heart of Tarzan is the idea that if you took an aristocratic English baby and put him in the heart of the African jungle, he would become king because he's best, you know, he's superior. Like, yeah. No, no one's buying that. <laughs> no, I guess. No, you, you can't, you know, it, you can't fix it. It's broken. It's, it's, you know, it belongs to the past. And, you know, James Bond is this uh, misogynistic uh, white establishment assassin, this murderer. He's pretty much everything that Generation Z defined themselves against. You know, he's the, for all the fact that he's continued for 60 years and picked up new generation fans and new generations of fans, it's going to be quite hard when they come back with the new James Bond to bridge the gap, because this is going to be the first millennial James Bond. Is that be amazing. Yeah, that was my threat. next question, actually, was I'm that sure. James Bond's greatest threat doesn't seem to be Spectre or Smirsh or anybody, <laughs> or anybody like that. It's the culture... It's the culture uh, wars. Mm. The culture is changing between, let's say, of course, between 1962 and today. Mm. But even from 2012 to today, mm. you've got the Me Too movement. You know, you've got now. Now, James Bond has had faced culture um, obstacles before, I mean, women's liberation, mm -hmm. and with and with the changing culture, and he's always seemed to survive uh, without him changing too much. Well, I, I, for me, he does change a lot. I think oh. he changes an awful lot. And he's certainly now, he's so removed from the, the character in the books that it's, it's, oh, it's course, very, yes. very different. Um, certainly, I, I, I don't even think Ian Fleming could have handled the Roger Moore <laughs> trail <laughs> if, if he'd said But the way that Bond um, succeeds, he has this strange um, ability to, um, uh, to, to be the, a, a fantasy of what, men want to be not not what men should be or not what men need to be but he's the current fantasy of what men would love to be right um and because because it is a fantasy it's never going to be you know uh something you can ideologically defend and it's never going to be pure and it's always going to be behind the curve but if you watch how the characters changed over the last 60 years that is the territory where cultural change does happen he is sort of mapping on to the way that men now are very different to the way men were in 1962 when when he first began. Um, it's a, and it's and it's real change. It's you know it's 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 stuff that's actually sort of happened. Um, as I say, it's going to be harder making the leap to a new generation of fans for a lot of reasons. I mean, it used to be the case that uh, as a young boy you'd watch James Bond. Uh, with your dad in front of the TV on bank holidays, on the t you know in front of the television, kids don't watch the television with their family on bank holidays or weekends or anything anymore. You know they they've got their own little screens in in their rooms and something like that. It's very hard to find a generational jumping on point. You know, in the nineties we had um, the Nintendo uh, GoldenEye video game which sort of reinvigorated the whole thing. And, you know, a lot of Generation X were suddenly on board with, with James Bond. It's hard to see how they're going to do that uh, for the next, without alienating, you know, the existing fan base too much. You know, if if you look at what, you know, a 30-year-old man would view as a sort of uh, uh, a fantasy of, of how they should be, you're probably looking at an actor like Harry Styles, but if, if there was a cast Harry Styles, the internet would explode in fury. <laughs> it's a very difficult job they've got, I think, next. And that, it's not surprising me that they're taking so long to, to do it or to, to, to try and get it right anyway. Have you, heard any, have you heard any scuttlebutt about who's going to be the next James Bond? <laughs> it's just taking so long. It's very, it's very, um, it's concerning the right word. It used to be that, you know, it's been what? 
four years since the last they finished making the last film. And in the eighties, they'd have you know recast with Timothy Dalton and made another two films in that in that right. period. You know, they just go in hard and um, plow straight on. And um, now there's there's it's still nothing. There doesn't seem to be any sense that they they have a script that they have a way forward. Um, yeah, it's it's odd. It's very odd how yeah. long it's taken. Not only do you mention the Beatles and James Bond, but during, in the book, you talk about the British psyche. And I want to touch on that because in 1962, uh, the British, well, the British um, Empire was breaking up. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, you know, people were coming to grips with what had happened in World War II because that was still fresh in many people's minds. Yeah. Uh, less than 20 years after the end of World War II. Um, and a lot of people in the British uh, British population have to come to grips with things that are changing rapidly. Absolutely, that affects them. Absolutely, I mean, at the end of the war, Britain was, you know, in pieces. Essentially, it was financially destroyed. It was many of its cities were destroyed, um, uh, and it had to sort of rebuild. And it it clearly was not what it had been. You know. Um, Countries tell stories about themselves and about two centuries leading up to this point, the story had always been, you know, uh, Britannia rules the waves. The sun never sets on the British Empire, the largest empire the world has ever seen. And and it'd been like that, as I say, for a couple of hundred years. And then uh, particularly after the Suez crisis, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Suez crisis in 1956. At that point, no one could pretend that we were still a global superpower or anything like that. It was all over. And it sort of raised the question, you know, well, if if we're not that, you know, then what are we? You know, who are we? What is Britain in the late 20th century? And so we were very, very keen for something modern, something new, a new vision of, of who we should be. And so for Bond and um, the Beatles to appear at that point, was just perfect because that's what they were they were offering us. The fact that they were appealed to the entire globe at the same time is you know uh, uh, is is also true. But for for Britain, they were offering very different visions. Uh, for in James Bond, you know the the uh, it was all about material improvements. It was about gadgets. It was about fast cars. It was about good food and going to beautiful places around the world and jets and travel and things like that. But in terms of attitudes they were to stay the same you know attitudes to women attitudes to foreign people you know attitudes to britain that was all sort of fixed the beatles are the absolute opposite of this they um they loved old things i mean they were you know, they they had the faux victoriana of you know sergeant pepper that they, they write songs about their childhood they were very uh, embracing of the past um but what they thought needed to change was ideas was attitudes. It was attitudes to um, sex, attitudes to women, attitudes to drugs, attitudes to religion. Um, that, that way you would create a modern Britain, a new Britain. So they're the complete opposite in, in many ways, uh, in, you know, of, of Bond and the Beatles. And that sort of, you can see that struggle sort of going on as, as the country, as this dazed, confused, broken country is trying to sort of get back on its feet and decide who it is. It still goes on to this day. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we really, really yeah. on our knees and struggling <laughs> at the moment. Oh, and I wouldn't say Britain's on their knees. I would say that, <laughs> that things are changing though rapidly. Or you're going to have a new king in a, in a few days. Or I, oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's. I've heard that's <laughs> happening. <laughs> Some people are very keen on it, but uh, they're probably a minority. Really? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, I mean, it's, it really, I wonder if, you know, you mentioned James Bond, people would have a, people making the films would have a hard time today, uh, making, it would be virtually impossible to make the 1962 version mm. of James Bond. Well, he, yeah, uh, I, and I think it might be impossible to make most versions because as a hero, he's, um, he's flawed in a fascinating way The the, um, the toxic aspects of male identity and the positive aspects of male identity are fused in this character in a way that 
they seem slightly indivisible. You know, he is a hero. He he does risk his life to save other people. Um, he, he he is the Lancelot, the White Knight, the, the mm-hmm. thing like that. But whereas you know most White Knight characters are just two dimensional good guys. You know, the fact that he puts his life on hold means that he can't have a proper relationship, you know. So you get that situation from the very first James Bond novel onwards, where if he sleeps with a woman, she dies, you know, which is at the heart of what's toxic about the character of James Bond. Amazing. Well, Uh, go ahead. I I was just going to say, it's kind of rare to get such a complicated character uh, and hold him up as as a hero. When they've tried to do spin-off films, like they were going to do one with Halle Berry, Berry right. as, as, as Jinx. Uh, and on paper, she was very much like James Bond, but she wasn't because she didn't have the inner flaws that Bond needs. So he is a fascinating character on, on those levels. So she was too perfect. Yeah, what, she was yeah. too... She, exactly. She was, it was like a committee had created her. Yeah. Whereas James, James Bond was Ian Fleming, basically. Exactly. It, was, it, was, it was his vision of himself. Well, I tell you, John Higgs is the author, and the book is Love and Let Die, James Bond, The Beatles, and The British Psyche. John, I want to thank you for being on Lights, Camera, Author today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Great talking to you, Jim. Thank you.